and welcome back to A Better World. This is your host, Mitchell J. Rabin, and I'm very glad you're joining us again today. Today we're going to have not only a very interesting, but a very special show because we have invited on a presidential candidate for the United States in the Justice Party, Rocky Anderson. Now, most people don't know a lot about third party candidates, including Rocky Anderson, even though he is gaining in recognition and prominence across the country. And A Better World, radio and TV has been playing an instrumental role in helping people get educated about Rocky's candidacy because it represents something very important for the American people at this critical moment in time of 2012. Rocky Anderson is the former mayor, a uh, two-term mayor of Salt Lake City, uh, managing a budget of some multi-hundred million dollars. He took very specific measures as an environmentalist, basically, in cleaning up the carbon footprint of Salt Lake City by a third in about three years, and has won so many humanitarian awards, uh, it would take too long to actually list them. But he, before uh, running for president, now he was uh, the executive director of an organization that he founded called the High Road to Human Rights, and for Human Rights, I should say. And he has been an advocate of minorities, of every single ethnic group, and has been battling as a lawyer for some 21 years any number of different antitrust kinds of litigations. So Rocky is a man for the people. This is why we wanted to have him on the show to talk with you all about his candidacy and what this country needs. So Rocky. Thank you very much, Mitchell. It's great, really a pleasure. Great to be here with you. I'm so glad. So listen, what is it that motivated you to do this? Is running for president with very little money and a minimum amount of national recognition, you must have had a, a burning feeling in your gut that you needed to do something. Well, I did, and Tell I actually that. hesitated for a long time. Mm -hmm. I, I thought about it long and hard, and ultimately I decided that things are going so badly in this country. We have a situation in this country where people are being left behind in very real ways, where people's lives have been turned upside down their homes being foreclosed upon, their homes being underwater, worth, worth less than their mortgages. Students own, owing more on student loans than the total amount of credit card debt in this country, and it's non-dischargeable in bankruptcy. These are debts that are going to be well, they, some would they're going say, to be facing the rest of their lives. Exactly. Some would say, Rocky, that these are economic issues. Not well, these political. are economic. Well, but that's political. There's that's what nothing I want to hear more from you. political than when people are hitting the pocketbook. But also, the really dangerous thing is, is people are scraping by day to day, while the the very wealthy are just getting wealthier. And, exactly. And, and the the ratio of CEO compensation uh, over is working men and anything women that is getting, has it's ever unprecedented. Been seen, Absolutely right. unprecedented. Exactly. So we have this what do you the, the greatest disparity in, in wealth and income at in any time. time since the twenties, but we also at the same time have this creeping totalitarianism. An imperial presidency, the executive branch under the Bush and Obama administrations where they have taken on these abusive powers, truly the powers of tyrants, saying that they have the power to indefinitely detain people, to incarcerate them, basically kidnap them, put them away without charges, trial, legal assistance, or the right of habeas corpus. We have a president who's making the decision as to who's going to be killed in a number of different nations, Yemen, Pakistan, Afghanistan, Somalia, so my question by these to unmanned you, drones. I totally understand and appreciate your points, and it is harrowing for anybody who knows about, has really looked at the Patriot Act, or the Military Commission Act, or the National Defense Authorization Act. All of those Act. things really All are subversive and un-American as any legislation. Our Constitution. So what I want to know is, and what our audience wants to know, Rocky, is what do you propose to turn this situation around? Both the political situation with the executive privileges of the office that have been given or taken, 
and what would you do about the foreclosure and all of the economic woes we're facing? We need leadership in the White House by somebody who will say, I'm not here to ratchet up the imperial powers of the president. I'm here to set it straight in terms of the separation of powers. I would make it clear, and I'd make sure that Congress made it abundantly clear, unlike what they did with the War Powers Resolution. Mm -hmm. But under the War Powers Clause of the Constitution, the sole prerogative of deciding whether we're going to make war against another nation is for Congress. It's not for the President. There's no greater power that can be abused, and it's been abused time after time. As Congress has sat back and allowed it, the courts won't determine these cases when they're brought before them saying they're just right. political questions. Why isn't the Justice Department playing a more judicial role well, than because, it is? Because you have an Attorney General. You have two kinds of attorneys, gen attorneys General. You have those who stand for the rule of law and will mm -hmm. apply the law and let the chips fall as they may. Well, people like Elliot Richardson who stood up mm -hmm. to President Nixon. And then you have people like Attorney General Eric Holder, who just does whatever the President of the United John States Ashcroft. wants him to do. Well, Ashcroft, but certainly now, yeah. that we, we, the President had the opportunity to say, we're going to apply the rule of law. Nobody's above the law. If there were laws broken in terms of illegal surveillance of American citizens, in torturing people on Wall Street, this massive financial fraud, then people are going to have to answer for it, just like they do any other crimes. But what do you but have to say? this president says, we're just going to look forward and And Eric Holder just does his it, bidding. As president of the United States, yes. I would say there is no one who is above the law. And if the law has been broken, people will be held to account. This and is then, such a breath of fresh air, I can't tell you, because this is not something that's been spoken of for the longest time. Look at what the Bush-Cheney administration got away with. Look at what Clinton got away with. It's not a question of Democrat or Republican. Both are guilty of similar kinds of war crimes and the like. So I completely agree with you. It would be so wonderful to have a president with a spine. But let me ask well, you this. Well, in a sense of the rule of law, a sense of where that yeah, that's president's right. place is exactly. in our constitution. Instead of a two-tiered system as we have now. Right. But look, we have some sense that something happens when people get into that Oval Office, Rocky, that the powers that be, economic powers, must come in some way and say, look, gentlemen, let's have a conversation. This is what we will be able to do. It doesn't and this not. have to be that way. We Tell can't me. ever just resign ourselves to the fact that, oh, it's always this way and the money's always going to mm -hmm. have its way. I mean, we are living in a plutocracy where money calls the shots in Washington and both right. Congress it's a holy and the White system. House. But we don't have to resign ourselves to that. If we, the American people, insist on better, we'll get better. We, the American people had so much better under Franklin Delano Roosevelt. Yes. He took on the moneyed interest. Teddy yes. Roosevelt took on mm -hmm. the moneyed interests. And we have seen those moments when, when Congress rose to the occasion. I mean, the Sherman Antitrust Act. You know, these, we had people representing Stand American people. to economic power. Who saw it as their role to represent the public interest, to be in there fighting for us. And now they're not doing that because they want to hold on to power. And the American people are letting it happen. And this is what I was going to say earlier. Well, things are economically so difficult and people are working two and three jobs to make ends meet and, and mm -hmm. trying to pay off their mortgages and student loans and exactly. all the rest and so insecure about what are they going to face in retirement or what are they going to face if there's a serious illness and we don't have a decent health care program in this country. So. They're not paying attention to things like indefinite detention or the targeting of U.S. citizens for assassination. Or foreign policy issues. Well, the, the, the drone attacks or the, the war decisions being made by the president rather than Congress. And yet all of that goes to the absolute core of what and who we are as a nation. 
and everything about our lives could be seriously and negatively impacted if we don't turn this In fact, all around. You're right. We are being negatively impacted right now. Hence the Occupy movement and things like that that have come to the foreground. What do you say, Rocky, to people who say, I understand and I appreciate everything that you're saying. However, in this case, we have an Obama and we have a Paul Ryan Romney. And the differences between them are rather severe when it comes to women, when it comes to rights, when it comes to economics, when it comes to the evisceration of Medicare, on and on and on across the board when it comes to the, the tax cuts. Not across the board. Not across the board. There are but, significant differences. There are significant differences. What do you say? There are always going to be some differences. But right. to vote for the Republican or the Democrat with the excuse that, well, we can't go in a different direction because that means the lesser of two evils isn't going to get elected. If we say that yes. in every election, we're just reaffirming the status quo, essentially. And again, so that's what not if we saying that there aren't differences. Most people saying, who would vote for you, let's say, would be Democrats, progressive thinkers, etc. That's not necessarily true. Oh, no. There are a lot of people Tell across me. the political spectrum that are very concerned about the undermining of the rule of law. They're concerned about the fat cats on Wall Street committing massive fraud and getting away with it and hurting so many of us. You have found you know, many the, Republicans that absolutely. are concerned about that? We had a state senator with us last night, and he was there 100 percent. And he said, you know... A Republican we, state senator from Connecticut? From Connecticut. The, the, they love and care about our Constitution just as much yes. as anybody else. Yes, indeed. We may have differences of opinion. Except for if they work for Goldman Sachs and Morgan Stanley. You know. but, but they don't. That's the yeah. point. They're getting taken advantage of. Their, their lives yes. are being negatively impacted just like everybody else. Their kids are taking out loans in order to afford to go to school and then hanging, having that debt hanging over their heads the rest of their lives. So you are finding that there is some rep what's called Republican support for your candidates? Absolutely. This is a broad-based movement and that's how it's got to be yes. if we're going to see these changes. Now, we've got to also be able to agree that we're not going to be purists. We're not going to agree 100% on all of the issues. Sure. But if we want to see the, the corrupting influence of money out of politics, we've got to come together and demand. Would you be in favor of the reinstatement of the Glass-Steagall Act? Absolutely. Instance? And Glass-Steagall was Depression-era legislation that FDR. prohibited the common ownership of commercial banks, investment banks, and insurance companies. Right. President Clinton, kowtowing to the Wall Street folks, signed off on the repeal of glass -Steagall. Larry Summers' no, recommendation. No good reason for it. On Larry Summers' recommendation, so who does President Obama bring in as his main economic advisor? Larry, Larry Summers. Summers. So don't tell me that there are there, these major differences, because President Obama has been you may think he's the lesser of two evils. I would say that he is the more effective of the two evils because he puts a nice face to it. And when he does it, the Democrats shut up about it and they allow things that if a Republican were doing these things, they would be out in the streets. They'd be demonstrating. There would be congressional hearings and subpoenas. They, they, they would be doing everything they could to stop the human and civil rights abuses, and also the, the caving in, the, abuses. the caving in to Wall Street. Mm -hmm. I mean, why do we still have banks that are too large to fail? It's not just and people not like one me. Prosecution. Not people. Not one. It's not just people like me that are calling for breaking up the banks that are too oh, big right. to fail. The Dallas branch of the Federal Reserve called for it, and if we don't do it, we're getting set up for yet another disaster with the government bailing out the banks with the excuse that if we don't, we're going to be facing a major depression again. Now, we can take these protective measures, reinstate Glass-Steagall, break up the banks that are too large to fail, impose the regulations. You were good at that. I mean, when you were being an antitrust lawyer, 
weren't you involved in helping to break up the large companies or challenge, well, challenging them in, in suit? I actually came in after these thrifts fell, and it turned out the insurance fund that everybody had been promised was there to mm -hmm. protect their money was inadequate, and my clients were losing their lifetime savings. So I pursued a securities theory, and I was successful. It was a mm. seminal securities case, and we Excellent. were able to, to prevail in that case. And it was, it was a, a, an important case around the country it's for these people to realize they don't just get to take everybody's money, go out and risk right. it, lose it. If there's not adequate insurance, just say, well, gee, that's really too bad, leaving everybody else holding the bag. And that's the kind of, of litigation that I handle. And when I'd walk in the courtroom with these people, people who had suffered from abuses of corporate power, people who had suffered from governmental abuses of power, I had a lot of civil rights litigation in my time. Mm -hmm. It was so beautiful to see these people where there was such an imbalance of power outside the courtroom. When you'd walk in, Lady Justice was blindfolded, those scales were even, and these people that were so powerful and abused their power on the outside had to account for it. And now you can understand so, why I am so outraged I do. at the fact that we have a President of the United States and an Attorney General and a Congress that seem to be okay with all of this who say that there are these rich and powerful people that have violated the law, they've committed federal felonies that we're going to say, oh, never mind, we're just well, going to look forward and forget about it. I agree. It. I understand. What would you do, though, on the level of Supreme Court? Because you've seen justice work in your own state um, through your own work as lawyer. What about something as egregious as Citizens United? Well, what the majority of people that? in this country want to see Citizens United overruled or, if we have to, to pass a constitutional amendment that would negate the ruling of citizens. But how will you but, then but, reconstitute but, the Supreme Court because they're all partisan? But our campaign system, yes. let me get back to that. Okay. Everybody talks about Citizens United. Yeah. It was rotten to the core before Citizens United. We still had a government this that was so, bought and paid for. That's true. So we can't now that we've got everybody's Put everything attention, there, right? Now that everybody's attention is focused on this issue, we've got to solve the entire problem and not just the overruling of Citizens United. We need to have strict limits on campaign contributions, get corporate money out of the system entirely, and make certain that these folks aren't beholden to those who bought their way into office the way they are now. Exactly. And that's the way it's actually been, unfortunately, traditionally in this country, going back to the era of the Carnegies and the Mellons and the Pullmans and But we've like had that. states people in Congress yes, and even have. statesmen in the White House. That's right. People who represented, who fought for the public interest. Talking and about the public interest. They're not there now. I'm, you're a good doctor. I like this. <laughs> so we're making progress here. What would you do about foreclosures? I, I think there needs to be a moratorium on foreclosures. You know, the, the Fed gave money, is still giving money at zero interest to all these big banks that caused this problem. Banks, in the first private place. businesses, they, Harley Davidson. They could I mean, provide, who ever heard of such a thing? They could provide the same 0% or very low interest money for those who have suffered as a result. And if people are underwater on their mortgages and they're making good faith efforts to get to pay. them paid off, mm -hmm. they need the help. And, and the government ought to be providing that help. The same with student loans. If people have been paying a certain percentage of their income over a certain period of time, those loans ought to be wiped out. Those should not be hanging over everybody's heads. And then, it, for the future, we need equal educational opportunity. And that means either free or low cost higher education. So do you our believe in our federal government underwriting the costs of these kinds of changes? Absolutely. Okay. It's the best investment. I mean, look, it, 
Our students are... Big government, small government, you know the conversation. No, this is about an investment in people's future. This is about an the American people of future, this country. Right. And about pulling our resources together to provide equal opportunity in education, in jobs, in, in job about health training, care? and certainly in health care. We're the only industrialized nation in the world where we don't provide essential health care for all of our citizens. And even when the Obama plan is in place, fully implemented, there will be 30 million people without any essential health care and we'll still see it's hundreds just, of thousands of bankruptcies every year. It's just an insurance boondoggle, it, really, you know, is all it really is. And all these other, for us. Absolutely. I mean, to, to guarantee that these for-profit insurance companies are going to have our business. There's not one other industrialized nation that depends upon for-profit insurance for the provision of essential health care. That it is doesn't such an happen important anywhere point, else. Rocky. We have seven, such an important point. 700,000 bankruptcies filed in this country because of high health Medical costs. bills. Exactly. And people don't take bankruptcy out because of their health care costs in other nations. Right. And we get worse medical outcomes. We're one of the worst in the industrialized world for both maternal mortality, that is women dying as mm -hmm. a result of childbirth, either before, just before, during, or after, and even infant mortality during the first year of life. We're, we have the next to the highest out of 35 industrial nations, scary. we're 34th. I have and to move us child along. child poverty, it's all related to poverty. The child poverty, it's of all course, related it's to a the economic of cycle. Exactly. Do you, do you know that among I have to ask you about nations, war and peace in a moment. And among industrialized nations, there are only two that have more than 20% child poverty. Romania is the worst. The United States is next to worse with 23% poverty rate among our children. It's outrageous. Just because of the sake of time, even though we both want to cry, we're going to move on to the next question, which is war and peace. I, what do we do? How do we deal with these international issues that face us in Afghanistan, still in Iraq, all that's going on with this notion of Al-Qaeda, what would you do as president? You build positive relationships. What Al-Qaeda, these people weren't just born angry at the United States. They were outraged that we lied about when we said we would get our uh, military bases out of Saudi Arabia and then didn't do it and then end up supporting these, these tyrants that are in power. Uh, and then of course, they were infuriated that during the sanctions against Iraq, a half million children, children Iraqi died. children, died because of those sanctions. And what did Madeleine Albright and say about it? Madeleine Albright was asked, was it worth the cost? And she said it was worth the cost. 16 afterwards, minutes. Afterwards, it was because nationally of the, televised. Because of the national outrage, she later retracted that statement. But that was a window I into their thinking. Well. Like the, yeah. It's worth a half million children's deaths to have imposed those sanctions. That's why we're so hated. And now we're going over with unmanned drones in all these other nations. We, have, we haven't declared war against these nations, and yet... So you're across. for diplomacy. You're for understanding human relationships. Building decent relationships. Nationally and internationally. Look what, look what's yes. happening with Iran. I mean, we're lining up behind Israel and the saber-rattling and talking about bombing Iran. Why aren't we recognizing the, how this will impact the Iranian people? Remembering that there were hundreds of thousands of Iranians out during candlelight vigils in sympathy for the victims of the 9-11 attacks. The Iranian people are beautiful, wonderful people. They don't hate us, the American people. But we're certainly going to, like we're doing in the rest of the Muslim and Arab world, we're going to drive them against us if we ever support a military attack on that nation.
And I, and hear I think you that we're hearing a lot of the same misinformation yeah, oh, now that we heard about it. It's right. just a reiteration of the same propaganda. You know, at base, what I hear you saying, Rocky, is that a foreign policy and a domestic policy needs to be dealt with with a level of trust, intelligence, and moving away from a fear-based society. That's what I hear you saying. And compassion. Compassion, of the course. The sense of humanity. You know, it, it, that's your treatment. I, I think, I, yeah. You know, the, exactly. The, the Iranian people, the Iraqi people, they respond to kindness like anybody else. And of I, people are going to say, I mean, a Henry Kissinger would say, "Oh, that's naive." Look what he brought to this nation: the Vietnam War, the secret bombing of Cambodia. Pinochet. These are truly international cr criminals. True. And. The, the day of the American empire building has got to come to an end. We can't go around imposing our will. I mean, the Iranian government and the hostility toward the United States, where did that start? It started with the United States, CIA, overthrowing the democratically elected, elected Mossadegh government in 1952. Iran. 1952. And then we ran right up to Guatemala the next year and did the same thing to the Gua to the democratically elected Arbenz government in Guatemala. Mm. And then imposed a, a tragic military government that we, we know the human rights So if violations. somebody were to, because we're just about out of time, what would you like to say to our audience? the American people uh, I, in your last I would say we need to take things in a very different direction. The Democratic and Republican parties now are part of this duopoly. They want, they want to, among themselves, monopolize political power. They don't want alternatives there. They both kowtow to Wall Street. They're bought and paid for. They feed at the same trough of special interest money from the same wealthy interests. And at the same time, we're seeing tremendous, a tremendous transformation of our republic, of our constitutional system. We need to make a major change in the public interest. And I would urge everyone, let your voice be heard for change and cast a ballot for an alternative to the Republican and Democratic parties. Rocky Anderson, I want to thank you so much for thank being you, a guest on our show. It's my pleasure. Thanks so much. Keep up the good work. I think it's fabulous what you're doing, and you know that we've been supportive of you from the beginning. You've been terrific. Thank you for helping us get out the work. Absolutely. This is Mitchell J. Rabin for A Better World. Thanks so much for joining us. Make sure you drop an email to me at mjr at abetterworld.net. Let me know your thoughts and comments about this, and go to Rocky's website, www.voterocky.org as well as abetterworld.tv where you can hear numerous interviews that I have conducted with Rocky along in one case with Representative Dennis Kucinich and Ralph Nader and uh, Barbara learn, Marks Hubbard and Barbara Marks Hubbard and learn more in context about what it is Rocky is bringing forward to us all. Thanks so much for joining us and I look forward to seeing you all next week.